Hi there, I welcome you to this third lecture on radiation protection course part 1. In the previous lecture, we looked at the radiation effects. We also looked at the ICRP 60 statement on principles of radiation protection, that is justification, optimization and dose limits. We also looked at how the dose limits changed over years and we also concluded radiation industry is a safe industry where the number of deaths per million is one or less. We also looked at very important parameters like tissue reaction, how the name terminology non-stochastic effect became deterministic effect and it is now tissue reaction and looked at the threshold doses for tissue reaction and how this also has evolved over the years particularly the threshold dose for islands, which has now been reduced to 0.5 gray, the threshold dose for circulatory system, which is now 0.5 gray. In this lecture, we will look at the factors that we have to concentrate on to protect the workers and the public from radiation. There are three factors that we have to look at when we decide on radiation protection practices. The three factors are time, distance and shielding. Keep the working time to a minimum. Do not linger in areas of known exposure. As far as distance is concerned, you have to remember the concept of inverse square law. Use long handle tools to manipulate the sources. And there are shielding materials which we could use as barriers between the worker and the radiation sources. And one has to know the attenuation characteristics of various sources and the shielding material. How to be time conscious? The basic principle is the dose is directly proportional to the time. More the time you spend, one is exposed to more dose. So the only way is to spend less time. Lesser the time you spend with radioactive sources, lesser is the dose received. Half the time, you get half the dose. How to reduce the time when you work with radioactive sources or work with radiation? Particularly when you work with radioactive sources, it is very important that you do the procedure with dummy sources first and learn it. For example, if you are assisting with low dose rate brachytherapy such as iodine 125, it is better to practice with a dummy source on how to handle it and then go on to using actual sources. In case you don't do that and you panic, you shouldn't panic. If you panic, you may make a mistake or you can spill the radioactive sources and then you spend more time in cleaning it or searching for it, etc. So plan well ahead and try to spend the minimum time with radioactive sources. It doesn't mean do it fast and come out. It means you have to plan ahead and proceed so that the time you spend with radioactive sources is kept to the minimum possible. The second factor is the distance. Greater the distance, lesser is the dose. The dose decreases by inverse square law. Never try to touch the source. In theory, the distance becomes almost zero, so the dose, if you touch, should become infinite. Try to use long forceps for handling of radioactive sources and try to keep yourself away from the source. How does the inverse square law work? What is the definition of inverse square law? I have done this in one of the lectures earlier, but I would like to repeat it here for continuity's sake. Intensity of radiation is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. And I have two diagrams here to explain how it works. You look at this diagram first. I have an area of 10 by 10, which is 100 centimeters square, 
where I have a radiation dose of 40 mA per hour. This is at 1 meter from the source. Now if I move another 1 meter, that is totally 2 meters from the source, the size of this area now becomes 20 by 20, which is 400 centimeters square. But the same 40 mR per hour, same number of photons, is now distributed four times the area. So the photon at any one point will be one by fourth of what you had here. Therefore, if you move from one meter to two meters, the dose decreases by a factor of four. It is not the same when you move from two meters to three meters. There also you move by one meter, but the decrease is not the same. Please remember that, okay? So when you take from the source point, then you can straight away apply this equation and say i is proportional to 1 by d square. Otherwise, you have to take both the points and do the inverse square law correction. Shielding is the third factor that you have to use. The basic principle here is place a shielding material between the source and the person to absorb as much as possible. If it is for X-ray photons or gamma ray photons, you can never stop the radiation. I hope you know that X-rays and gamma rays can never be totally stopped. Because of its exponential attenuation, it can only be decreased and brought as close to a very small amount. It, it will never touch the x-axis, you know, the attenuation graph. In other words, the attenuation graph will touch the x-axis at infinity. So this is one that explains you. Suppose if you place a material, you have different types of radiations. Here, for example, you have a alpha radiation. If you place a small paper, probably, the alpha radiations will be stopped because it's densely ionizing radiation. You won't have alpha penetrating through that. But beta radiation would penetrate. It is little less densely ionizing radiation and little more penetrating. And if you keep something like a wood or plastic, you may be able to stop beta radiation. But the gamma radiation would penetrate the paper, the wood or plastic. And it will go further. If you, if you want to reduce the gamma radiation, you have to use a high density material. And there, it, there also the gamma radiation or X radiation cannot be totally stopped. It can, its intensity can only be reduced. If it is neutrons absorbed by hydrogen rich material, we will discuss that more in detail when we look at the shielding of radiotherapy installations. How does shielding help? It reduces the radiation or intensity or it stops the radiation, but it depends on what type of radiation is that. As I said earlier, it will stop if it is alpha or beta, but if it is X or gamma rays, it cannot be stopped. It intensity can only be reduced. The shielding also depends on the energy of the radiation. How much is attenuated depends on the energy, the type of radiation, whether it is alpha, beta, gamma, or X-rays, and the type and material of shielding. One has to be mindful of the fact radiation is emitted in 4 pi geometry unless it is well collimated. So when you look at radiation shielding, you should always remember the radiation goes in 4 pi geometry, not in one particular direction. What are the shielding materials? What are the requirements of shielding material? Shielding of high energy would require high density material. This is very important because high energy is mostly Compton interaction. Compton interaction depends on the density of the medium rather than the atomic number. But if you are doing using low energy and you need to shield low energy X-ray or gamma ray photons, then you would need high atomic number material because you have more of photoelectric absorption. Use the concept of half valley layer and 10th valley layer to decide on the shielding requirement. We will discuss this in abundance when we'll discuss about the shielding of radiotherapy installations. What are the very commonly used shielding materials? 
Lead is a very commonly used shielding material because of its high density and high atomic number, high physical density. So you need very small space. So space saving can happen. High atomic number, good shielding for low energy X-rays, relatively expensive, but also it is difficult to work with because it's very heavy and it has got a very high melting point of 360 degrees centigrade. One can think of using iron or steel alternatively, but relatively high physical density, so space requirement is acceptable. Self-supporting structure, it's relatively easy to mount compared to lead and relatively less expensive compared to lead. Concrete is another shielding material that's very commonly used. It's relatively cheaper and it's self-supporting, easy to use. You can make very thick barriers for mega voltage photon radiation with concrete. Variation in density could occur if you don't mix the concrete properly. The density could be very different. One needs to keep checking this. There could be voids, voids in the building, which could also create problem as far as attenuation is concerned. The other one is the earth filling. You can just use earth. Uh, it is quite useful in elevated areas, but people don't really depend on earth filling nowadays. Let us look at some of the properties of shielding materials. Walls, bricks, concrete, steel or any structure used for building could serve as a shielding material. If space is a constraint, one could use high density concrete of density up to 4 gram per centimeter cube. Normal concrete, the density is about 3 point gram per centimeter cube. Certainly the space required for the building or the wall with high density concrete would be considerably less. One could use composite materials also, that is something like metal bits embedded in concrete. This table gives an idea about what is the density and what is the atomic number and the relative cost of it. Let us assume using concrete costs you a factor of 1 uh, with a density of 2.3 and atomic number 11. If you use heavy concrete with atomic uh, density around 4 and atomic number 26, the, the cost would go up to about 5.8 times. This is an approximate value. Uh, if you use steel, again, you can reduce significant of space because the density is almost like four times of the density of concrete. So the thickness would come down by four times. Lead, the thickness will come down by nearly five times. So it would be a good idea to use these high density materials. But at the same time, please remember, it's not easy to use them, a heavy, expensive, see for lead, the relative cost could be even as, as much as 22 times of concrete. Earth filling, earth packed could also be used. But the only issue is if you have earth packed, later on somebody shouldn't think that just earth, they may forget that it is a shielding material and may do some other construction there. So one has to be a bit careful about using earth packing. I would like to talk about attenuation of X and gamma rays again in this lecture because this is a very important concept for radiation shielding and protection. The graph if you look at is slightly different from the graph that we saw in the previous lecture in the sense that it is not plotted on a linear scale rather it is plotted on a semi log scale that is the y axis the intensity is in logarithmic scale the x axis the thickness of the barrier is in linear scale. The equation for attenuation is nx is equal to n0 e power minus mu x where mu is the attenuation coefficient and x is the thickness. The half value layer is given by the equation 0 0.693 by mu and the tenth value layer which reduces the intensity of radiation to one tenth of the original value is given by 2.3 by mu. If you look at this graph the half value layer is, for example, in this case is 6 millimeter and the 10th value layer is about 20 or 21 millimeter. There are two points I would like to stress. The half value layer, this is called the first half value layer. The second half value layer will be equal to this 
if it is a monochromatic beam. If the beam is polychromatic, the second Hopperly layer will be larger than the first Hopperly layer. And for all your attenuation calculation, you have to use the second Hopperly layer. If it is a monochromatic beam, the first Hopperly layer and the second Hopperly layer will be the same because there won't be any beam hardening. The second thing I want to stress is when you measure Hopperly layer thickness, you have to use narrow beam geometry to eliminate the scatter that may influence your measurement. This slide provides you the mass attenuation coefficient, half valley layer and tenth valley layer for certain materials. For example, you can see the water, the mass attenuation coefficient, that is linear attenuation coefficient divided by the density, which is the mass attenuation coefficient, is 0 0.0707 and it's very nearly the same for everything, not a big difference except for lead, which is slightly lower than other shielding materials. If you look at the half valley layer and the tenth valley layer, for various energies and various materials such as lead, iron and concrete, you can see how these things vary. It is 0.48 for iridium with lead and if you use iron it is 1.27 in centimeters and concrete is 4.5 centimeters. Similarly you have for cesium, cobalt and radium. Let us now do a couple of calculations. Let us look at this problem. The exposure rate at a particular point is 100 hour per hour. I'm using hour per hour. Due to 1.33 MeV, probably cobalt 60. What would be the resulting exposure rate if one centimeter lead shield were employed? Please note it's lead shield between the source and the point. Assume narrow beam geometry and the density of the lead is given. The reason it's given is most of the time we are supposed to be using mass attenuation coefficient mu by rho so to eliminate the rho, you have to multiply it by the density. The mass attenuation of lead is for cobalt 60 gamma energy is 0 0.057. So if you apply that in this equation, if you substitute for mass attenuation coefficient and density and also the thickness x which is now 1 centimeter, you get the exposure after the lead shield as for 52 or per hour. Let us try one more calculation where you have to determine the shielding thickness. What thickness of lead shield would be required to reduce the exposure rate due to cesium from 100 hour per hour to 1 hour per hour? The mass attenuation coefficient for cesium is 0.11 for lead. And the density of lead is 11.35 gram per centimeter cube. Now, you can rearrange this equation for attenuation. That is Nx is equal to N0 e power minus mu x. Can you rearrange it for x? x is equal to minus 1 by mu log N by N0. This mu can be replaced by mu by rho, which is the mass attenuation coefficient. You replace linear attenuation coefficient by mass attenuation coefficient but multiply by the density so that it is still linear attenuation coefficient. The mu by rho that is the mass attenuation coefficient for cesium energy for lead is 0 0.11. You substitute that and substitute the density and n is equal to 1. n0 is 100 hour. So the x is equal to 3.7 centimeter the lead thickness required to reduce the intensity from 100 hour to 1 hour is 3.7 centimeter. Let us look at the situation where you have multiple energies, it's not single energy. How do you handle the situation where the exposure rate is due to more than one gamma ray energy? For shielding multiple gamma ray energies, the correct approach is to determine the exposure rate for each gamma ray energy. For this, you have to know the contribution or the number of photons from each gamma ray energy. For example, let us say, let us say cobalt. 
you have two, two gamma ray energies, 1.17 and 1.33. But we know the number of photons of 1.17 and 1.33 are almost equal, so you can take a mathematical average. This is not the case, for example, if you take iridium, each photon will have different weightages. So you have to apply the weightage and correct the exposure rate for each gamma ray energy. Another simple approach would be to just use the highest gamma ray energies. For example, if you are doing for cobalt, I would use 1.33 rather than 1.17 because I know the numbers are the same and calculate the attenuation for 1.33 which would be okay for 1.17. I just go for higher energy. But this method may not be acceptable if you are going for higher energy, for example, like americium and cesium. And here you would be unnecessarily doing more material, you know, shielding for high energy where the contribution for high energy is much less. So here you need to do the exposure rate for each and then calculate independently and then sum it up for two energies. If you have multiple layer shielding, for example, you have two layers here, X1 and X2, having different densities. And if you want to know the exposure at this point, X, Nx is equal to N0 minus mu X1, mu1 X1, I would say, e power minus mu2 X2, but it is written as mu by rho into rho1, mu by rho into rho2. That is, these are two different materials, right? And you are, I have included the mass attenuation coefficient. Otherwise, it will be mu1, x1, mu2, x2. So this is how you determine the exposure if you have multiple layered shielding. Another approach to determine the shielding thickness is to use half valley layer and the tenth valley layers rather than the mass attenuation coefficient. We know the equation HVL is equal to 0.693 by mu. And we also know N is equal to N0 e power minus 0.693 by HVL into the thickness. This equation can be written, simplified and written as N is equal to N0 into 0.5 to the power number of HVLs. The number of HVLs, if you want to know, you divide thickness by the HVL of the particular material. Similarly, for TVLs, you can write the same equation as n is equal to n0 into 0.1 to the power number of TVLs or n is equal to n0 0.1 to the power thickness divided by the number of TVLs. Let us try to solve this problem on the basis of TVL and HVL. The equal dose at a point is 2000 microsievert. How many TVL or HVL would be required to reduce the dose to 1 microsievert? We know very well n is equal to n0 into 0.5 to the power number of HVLs that we saw in the previous slide. I substitute n by value of 1 because it has to be reduced to 1 microsievert, n0 by 2000. And if this is the equation I get, 1 is equal to 2000 into 0.5 to the power number of HVLs. I now rearrange this equation and take logarithm on both sides and I get log of 1 by 2000 is equal to number of HVL into log of 0.5. So now I rearrange this equation again to get the number of HVLs is equal to log of 1 by 2000 by log of 0.5 which if I calculate will be 10.96 or 11. So basically I would need 11 HVLs to reduce the dose from 2000 microsievert to 1 microsievert or alternatively if I use TVLs it will be log of 1 by 2000 divided by log of 0.1 instead of 0.5 so if I do this calculation I would need 3.3 tenth value layers so if I am going by half value layer thickness it will be 10.96 or 11 if I go by tenth value layer it will be 3.3. You would need basically 3 tenth value layers plus 1 half value layer as per this 
optical. We will now move on to radiation detectors that are used in radiation protection. In radiation protection, you need area monitors, server meters, contamination monitors, and personal dosimeters. Let us look at the principles of radiation detection with respect to radiation protection. One would use a large volume ionization chamber because in radiation protection, most of the time you will be measuring very low level radiation. To measure low level radiation, the volume of the ion chamber has to be increased so that it becomes more sensitive. So if you're using ionization chamber, one would use a large volume ionization chamber. Alternatively, Geiger and proportional counters could be used. Scintillation detector, detectors are also used in radiation protection. And film dosimetry and thermoluminescent dosimetry are used for personal monitoring in radiation protection. Let us now look at the principle of an ionization chamber. I have the picture of a standard ionization chamber here, but my aim is not to talk to you about standard ionization chamber, but rather use this to explain the basic principle of working of an ionization chamber. As you can see here, the ionization chamber consists of two electrodes. One of the electrodes is connected to the negative potential, the other one is connected to a positive potential and that to an electrometer. The ionization chamber is usually filled with air as the medium and the, expo the radiation that pass through the air ionize the air molecules. The positive ions go towards the negative electrode and the negative ions are collected by the positive electrode. The ion collection to the electrode is also dependent on the voltage. As you increase the voltage, more ions will be traveling towards the electrode and will be collected by the electrode. But after some time when you increase the voltage, it gets saturated, which means all the ions are collected. What you see here is the ionization detector graph and using this graph we can explain the function of ionization chamber, the proportional counter and the geiger muller counter. As you know, as I increase the voltage between the electrodes, the charge collected will increase. And this is how it goes increasing. But in this portion, not all the ions are collected, there are some of the ions left over. And these ions recombine and hence this region is called recombination region. As I further increase the voltage, it goes to almost a saturation region. That is, there are no more ions to get collected, it is saturated. And this region is called near saturation region. If I increase the voltage further, it goes to a complete saturation. And this region is called saturation region. And suppose if I increase the voltage further, what should happen? I said there all the ions are collected, there are no more ions to be collected. So if I increase the voltage further, it should just spoil the equipment. But what happens actually, you can see, there is a further increase in the charge collected. And this region is called the proportional region. I keep on going increase the, increasing the voltage and I have an increase in the charge collected and this region, it again becomes flat. That means there is no more charge collection. This region is called the geiger muller region. And this region is called the proportional region. As you can see, there is a proportionality in charge collection. This is a geiger muller counter that you see in the picture here. It is very similar to an ionization chamber, but the issue is you operate it at a very high voltage. It's not necessarily 500, you go up to 1000 voltage and the, it is filled with a low pressure gas and it is sealed. The ionization happens inside this when radiation falls on it. And for every ion produced, because of the high voltage between the electrodes, the ions actually gain energy and produce further ionization. For every ion produced, there are at least 10 power 6 ions produced in the geiger muller region. This is what is called production of avalanche of ionization. Therefore, for every ion, 
there is a multiplication factor of 10 power 6 which means there is an internal amplification that happens. You could question me why not you just take the charge and amplify it externally with an electronic amplifier. When you use an electronic amplifier there is a problem of noise. So the signal to noise ratio will become an issue there. But when you amplify it internally there is no problem of noise and the internal amplification makes it very sensitive. So Geiger-Muller counters are much more sensitive than ionization chambers. So this is used for very low level radiation measurement. Here you see two survey meters. One of them uses a large volume ionization chamber. The volume is 349 cc, very close to 400 cc. It can be used for both beta and gamma. For measurement of beta, it has got a slide window of very small thin uh, Mailer window, which is 440 milligram per centimeter square thickness. And it can go from a range of 5 mR to up to 50 R, you know, that it can go to a very large range. The other one you see here is a survey meter with a GM detector, right? It can go for X and gamma radiation of 60 kV, kV to 1.3 MeV. When you want to use it as a contamination monitor or an area monitor where you are supposed to be measuring very, very low level radiation, it is normally based on geiger muller counter. So here you see an area monitor which has a GM counter inside. Here you see a contamination monitor which again has a GM detector inside. Let us go on to neutron survey. Neutrons are normally to be surveyed in high energy linear accelerator. Neutron area survey meter operate in the proportional region. This enables separation of photon background. So that's an advantage here. Thermal neutron detectors usually have a coating of boron compound on the inside of the wall or the counter is filled with BF3 grass. A thermal neutron interacts with the beta nucleus causing an N alpha reaction. So it produces alpha particles. And these alpha particles are easily detected because of their very high ionizing capability. This is the basic principle of neutron survey meters. To detect fast neutron, the same counter is surrounded by a moderator made of hydrogenous material. The fast neutron interacting with the moderator are thermalized and detected by BF3 counter placed inside the moderator. Filter compensation is applied to reduce the thermal range over response so that the response follows the DICRP radiation weighting factor, the WR. Other neutron detectors based on helium also function on the same principle. As I said earlier in one of the slides, the neutrons are detected not directly, but through a nuclear reaction, that is what I call the N-alpha reaction, where energetically charged particles such as alpha particles are produced. And the alpha particle ionization is what is measured. But in several instances, intense gamma field, gamma rays are also found with neutrons. Therefore, your neutron detector should be able to distinguish between gamma rays as well as the neutron. So it is important to choose a method of neutron detection with the ability to discriminate between gamma rays and the neutrons in the detector detection process. Here is a helium based neutron detector. It uses a helium proportional detection of size about 1.6 to 2.5 centimeter. It is surrounded by about 23 centimeter diameter cadmium loaded polyethylene sphere. You can see this, this is the polyethylene sphere. Gamma background rejection of up to 100 millisievert per hour, so it can reject gamma rays. It detects thermal as well as fast neutrons. That is about 0 0.025 electron volt to about 12 MeV it can detect. The reaction that converts low neutron into the detectable particle is this. That is the neutron plus helium makes H3 plus H1 which is 
this is hydrogen plus 0.764 MeV. Measurement range of about 0 to 100 millisievert per hour. We will go on next to personal monitoring. The radiation workers are to be monitored, right? There are different personal monitoring devices available. Olden days we had the film badge. Still certain countries use film badge, but in general it has been discontinued. But for academic reason, I will take you through the film badge also. Now we have what is the thermoluminescent dosimeter which is used as a personal monitoring device and pocket dosimeters. The personal monitors are used to monitor whole body dose and in certain specific cases it is also used to know the dose to extremities particularly while handling radioactive sources. These are the two personal monitoring detectors which are very commonly used this one is the film badge. It is quite expensive and but it has a permanent record. There is a delay before the results are available. Thermoluminescent dosimeter, you can see this is the one that's used in India. It is reusable, easily automated, more sensitive than film. There is a delay before results are available, just like the film. I'll tell you why the delays are. Let us look at the film badge as a personal dosimeter device. It's a small film, something like the dental film, kept in a holder with the different filters. It's actually double-sided film, it's not one side. Both sides are coated. One is fast film, one side is slow film. The holder has got six windows and five windows will have filters. And one window is left open. The film needs to be measured using densitometry method. So you need to do a calibration of the optical density of the film and then use it for measurement of the dose absorbed by the film. Beta, gamma and neutron doses are measured by subtraction. I can explain you how the subtraction happens to some extent. This open window will receive all radiation that the individual received. The plastic will receive everything minus the beta. So if you do a subtraction, you get what is the beta dose here. Copper 1 and copper 2 are for low energy x-rays and high energy x-rays. So similar subtraction will provide the dose due to low energy x-rays and high energy x-rays. And lead is for high energy gamma radiation and cadmium is for neutron radiation. So just by subtracting one from the other, you'll be able to say how much of beta, how much of X-rays, how much of gamma rays and how much of neutron. One of the advantages of film is that you can keep it as a permanent record. Only thing you need to have a control also with that. And you, can, you should be able to measure it even after a few years. The next dosimeter which is normally used nowadays in personal monitoring is the thermoluminescent dosimetry. The principle of thermoluminescent dosimetry is that certain crystals when irradiated store the absorbed energy and emit them in the form of visible light when heated. Very commonly used thermoluminescent materials in radiation dosimetry are lithium fluoride and lithium borate and calcium sulfate but all of them have some impurities so that it works as a luminescent material. These crystals are non-conducting that is the conduction band is empty, empty and at room temperature all the electrons are confined to valence band. When irradiated some of the electrons gain enough energy and get into the conductivity band. See from valence band when irradiated they move into the conduction band. In TL materials there are a number of imperfections in the crystal which can trap these electrons from conduction band and at an energy state which is between the valence band and the conduction band. So the electron traps happen here because of different impurities, imperfections in the crystal. The probability that these electrons gain enough energy to escape 
to the conduction band and return to the valence band depends on the depth of the electron trap, you know, how depth, deep is the electron trap, a quantum mechanical transition frequency and the temperature. So that means when temperature is increased, the probability that the electron raised to conduction band and then go on to the valence band to recombine increases. So these electrons actually recombine with holes in the valence band and during the process visible light is emitted as you can see in this. A second type of crystal impurity is required for this type of transition. For readout of these crystals after irradiation, the crystals are heated with a constant heating rate. The light output can be plotted against the time. And this is actually referred to as the glow curve of a steel material. The peaks depend on the type of steel material. The area under the curve actually gives the total thermoluminescence output. And the different peaks here, 1, 2, 3, actually show, uh, shown in this glow curve refer to different traps for electrons in the crystal. These refer to different traps in the, the maximum peak, this one happens out around 200 degrees centigrade temperature. So it has to be heated to a high temperature at a constant rate. Let us look at some of the properties of the thermoluminescent crystals. For radiation dosimetry, particularly in radiotherapy, we expect the effective atomic number to be closer to that of water or we call it tissue equivalent. For that purpose, one would prefer lithium fluoride or lithium borate. However, in radiation protection dosimetry, as you will be measuring very low level radiation, higher sensitivity will be required. Therefore, Al2 and calcium sulfate, the calcium sulfate with the impurity of dysprosium are preferred. These are available in different forms. You can get TLD, rods, disc or ribbon. The Thermal fading has to be negligible. Light output should be linear with dose for a wide range of dose. It should have high thermoluminescence sensitivity. The emission, light emission, should be preferably in the visible region. The glow curve usually peaks at about 200, 200 degrees centigrade. Let us now look at how this thermoluminescent material is used for personal monitoring. Calcium sulfate in the form of disc of di diameter 13.3 mm and thickness 0.8 mm is placed in a holder called a thermoluminescent dosimeter holder. This holder has got three openings. The first opening has a filter which is a metallic filter. The second opening has a filter which is a plastic filter and the third one is fully open. The first one, the D1, is sandwiched between a pair of filter combination of 1 mm of aluminium and 0.9 mm of copper. In total, it's about 1000 mg per centimeter square, the thickness. The disc 2 is sandwiched between a pair of plastic filters of thickness 1.5 mm. Disc 3 is behind the open window, which will receive all types of radiation. This is the actual TLD holder that is used in our country, in India, that has got a metallic filter, the plastic filter and the open window. Let us now look at how this personal monitoring devices is to be used by each individual. If you are measuring whole body dose, it has to be worn at the chest level. And if you are wearing an apron, the TLD should be inside the apron and not outside the apron as it is here. TLD should be stored in a designated place and never in any radiation area. You have to be very careful because I know people who leave it in the um, control room in a desk and next day the physics will come and use the desk for something else and even he may take it into the room for some purpose and then the TLDs get exposed. The control TLD should be in a place where there is no radiation. It should be a radiation-free area. These are some examples of personal monitoring 
devices, particularly the TLD badges used for different purposes uh, of personal monitoring. This is the similar to what I showed for the TLD badge that we use in our country. I think this is the one that I used to when I was in Canada. This is for the whole body personal monitoring. If you're working with radioactive sources with your hands, it is better to use a ring badge or a finger badge where the TLDs are kept here, which can be used. You can see that how it is worn. We used to have forehead badges when we were used to prepare manual brachytherapy sources so that when you stand behind a lead bench and look into the sources, there is likelihood your face will get irradiated. So we used to have a forehead badge. So you can have badges for your extremities like hands, foreheads and things like that. And these are some of the examples for them. The last one for personal monitoring is the pen or the pocket dosimeter. One of the major advantages of using the pen dosimeter or the pocket dosimeter is that you can yourself read the dose. You don't need to send it to an agency and wait for the reading to be sent to you. Actually, this pocket dosimeter is an ion chamber with size of a fountain pen with a direct reading scale showing exposure from external sources. And this is the scale that you can see. When you charge this, the needle moves, the wire moves towards zero. You have to set it like this. And when it gets exposed and it discharges, and then during discharge, the needle move, will move towards it, which is calibrated against the radiation dose in MR. So you will be able to read it. There are digital ones are also available now. So you can purchase one of these digital ones if you want to carry it in hand. You can also look for one with audio alarm so that some of sometime it is nice to have an uh, dosimeter with an audio so that uh, you don't need to keep looking at it you take it to the place if there is radiation it will give you alarm these there are two types of pocket dosimeter one is sensitive only to beta gamma radiation and the other one is beta gamma and neutron radiation and various ranges are possible not necessarily you have to have only 0 to 200. I had this one which even up to 0 to 5 R. So these are various ranges of pocket dosimeters are possible. These are quite useful if you're going to have any planned operation like in case source is stuck in your cobalt and somebody has to go and release the patient and push it in. Immediately they can wear this and go and do it and you will know exactly how much dose they received immediately after that operation. You don't need to wait for the agency to send you the doses. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. I hope these three lectures were very useful to understand radiation protection to a large extent. In the part two of radiation protection, we will discuss about the facility design, mainly with respect to radiation oncology bunker designs. Thank you very much. Please do the assignments. I'm sure you will enjoy doing the assignments as well as listening to this.